Welcome to session four of the Gospel of the Kingdom of God class. Um, this is a, a foundational class for new Christians or for Christians who are, um, uh, you know, want to go back and and reset that foundation of the gospel, or even people who are are thinking about it um, and considering Christianity. If you are coming into the middle of one of these sessions, uh, be sure to go back and watch them in series. They build on each other. So if you kind of take them out of turn, they, they may not make as much sense. Uh, so you definitely want to watch them in, in sequence. So uh, we'll have three segments tonight. Uh, but first, let's, let's do a quick recap. Session one, we learned that the gospel is the kingdom, and that means the reign and rule of God, which exists both now among God's people and in the future filling the earth. In session two, we saw that Adam and Eve violated the commandment to not reject God's authority for their own. This was what was meant by the knowledge of good and evil, and that brought about death. And mankind has followed that pattern ever since. And the good news is that God has made a way to overcome the problem of permanent death by returning to his authority. In the last session, we learned that God's rule and reign comes through covenants. And the new covenant is the final covenant God is offering to mankind to return to him. And we learned that the man, Jesus of Nazareth, is the promised messianic king who initiated and who oversees the new covenant even today. So in this session, session four, in part one, we're going to uh, talk about the terms uh, in the sermon, that the terms are in the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to see why. Why is it that I say that the terms of the new covenant are in the Sermon on the Mount? And then uh, part two, we'll take a look at the first portion of the Sermon on the Mount, which uh, I call the commandments. And then the uh, second part of the Sermon on the Mount, we'll do in part three tonight, which is I call how to fulfill the commandments. And we'll, we'll over the next, we're just going to do an overview in this session. In the next three sessions after that, we're going to dig down in the Sermon on the Mount in detail. All right, so let's get into part one. The terms are in the Sermon on the Mount. So we asked the question last time, so where are the terms? You know, what are the terms and where are they of the new covenant? Because a covenant is a kind of relational contract and um, very, um, uh, you know, very important to know what the terms are. If you're going to sign up for a contract, you need to know them. You need to know what are these terms. So where are they? So the terms, I say that the terms are in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. And for those of you who don't know, the Sermon on the Mount is a, um, a sermon of Jesus that's uh, as recorded in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And the, uh, it's you know, called the Sermon on the Mount because he's up on a mountain and he's delivering this sermon, so to speak, uh, most scholars are going to be in agreement that the Sermon on the Mount isn't intended to be sort of this historical, Jesus went up on this mountain and gave this particular sermon. But rather, these are the collection of things that Jesus was saying, and Matthew has formed them into a sermon for our benefit. So we can kind of get um, all in one package, the, these things that Jesus was saying. When you go into Luke, for instance, you'll see the Sermon on the Mount, but not all in one place. It's all over the place. And, and um, Luke says in his gospel that the purpose of his gospel was to set things in their chronological order. And uh, so we can see that, you know, if Matthew doesn't match up with, with Luke, Luke's telling us what the real chronology was. Whereas Matthew has a different purpose in mind, and he's trying to show us the things that Jesus was saying in ways that, that we can take in, in whole parts. So, so I have two reasons why I say that the terms of the covenant are in the Sermon on the Mount. It's not that you can't find the terms in other places. You certainly can. And I won't say that 100% of everything in, uh, is in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, for example, um, Jesus gives us our great commandment in John 13, 34, 
love one another as I have loved you. And that's not in the Sermon on the Mount. It's uh, clearly taught and implied in the Sermon on the Mount, but it's not expressly stated like it is in John 13, 34. So I'm not saying that it's a hundred percent, but it's good enough to truly understand what the terms are and what you're committing to if you commit to this covenant. And so I say that um, for two reasons. The first reason is that um, we see in the record of Matthew that this the sermon teaches those who would follow Jesus, right? So it's, it's a sermon that's dedicated to those who make the decision, hey, you know what? I, I like what this guy is saying. I'm going to follow him. And, and we're going to see that in um, what was uh, in right before the chapters on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew is saying some stuff that we're going to read here in a second. And you'll see that the sermon was intended for those who are responding to this gospel message of the kingdom of God. They want to know more. And so those people who are responding to it, the disciples, they're the ones who he's going to go ahead and tell these terms to. And so that's that's kind of why uh, one reason why I say. It. So let's read this. Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through Matthew chapter 5, verse 2. Jesus was going about in all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every sickness among the people. And the news about him spread throughout Syria and they brought him up, they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and severe pain, demon possessed, people with epilepsy and people who were paralyzed and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Uh, chapter five, verse one. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and began to teach them saying, and then you get the Sermon on the Mount, right? So we can see in this record, he's going around all the cities and all these people are coming from all over to get healed and to hear his message um, this message of the gospel of the kingdom. And when he, you know, he tells us this message about God's reign being offered through a covenant that um, God's kingdom is at hand. And uh, he's telling people like John the Baptist to repent and uh, to, to follow. Right. And so here we see, okay, he sees all these crowds goes up on the mountain and his disciples, so he's kind of escaping onto the mountain, right? And his disciples come to him and he opens his mouth. So these are the disciples, right? And there were a lot of them at this time, um, uh, really thousands as, as he began to gather them. And uh, later they would start to drop off because they, they didn't like the message that they heard and those requirements of the terms. They didn't like that, the sound of that. And a lot of them left. And so so we can see in this transition from chapter four to chapter five, okay, he's been preaching this. His disciples are going to come to him. Now he's going to tell them, okay, here's your expectation. Here's what is expected of you. The second reason that uh, I say that the, the Sermon on the Mount is essentially the terms of the covenant is that it is structured like the old covenant uh, in the, uh, the old Mosaic covenant found in Exodus and in uh, Deuteronomy. And uh, the, that Mosaic covenant, it has a particular form and um, that we're going to see, we're going to talk about that form here in a minute. And the, um, the Sermon on the Mount is, is matching largely that same form. Now there, there are differences between the two, but when we get through with this, you'll see what I'm talking about, that there's, there's enough similarity to catch your attention. If you're very familiar with that old covenant, like the Jews of the day were, where if you, you know, this is something you've studied all your life is this, the, this covenant in Exodus covenant gets modified in Deuteronomy. They're very, very familiar with it. And so here you get this this uh, Sermon on the Mount, and you can kind of see it's in the same format. And so it's triggering you to think, oh, okay, Matthew is sort of compiled 
a, a, a book of the covenant, so to speak, for us to understand what the terms are. So let's look first at the, the format of the Mosaic Covenant. So the Mosaic Covenant, or the Old Covenant, includes both the Book of the Covenant, which is in Exodus chapter 20 through 23, and the affirmation and modifications to the Book of the Covenant that are found in Deuteronomy chapter 5 through chapter 26. So what you want to understand is Moses, when he receives the covenant from God. God's going to make a covenant. God gives him the, the commands of the covenant, the, uh, what were called the words of the covenant. And, and then a number of stipulations. We'll talk about the difference here in a minute. And, and, and then later, when they're about to enter into the promised land, Moses is going to reaffirm this covenant and, uh, and the, the Ten Commandments. And he's going to make a whole lot of modifications uh, to the covenant uh, that God wants to make with the people before they enter into uh, the promised land. And everybody, so God is wanting to make changes for a ver whole variety of reasons. And the people have to agree to that, which they do. So just like any contract, if you've got a contract with somebody and they want to make modifications to it, well, they need to come to you typically um, it, and, you know, you both sign off on those, those modifications. So that's what's going on in Deuteronomy. The format and procedures of the covenant in Exodus and Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy match typical covenants from the 13th and 14th century BC. So if anybody ever tells you, well, now scholars know that the, the Mosaic covenant was you know, written sometime after the 5th century BC. Well, the problem with that theory, um, and it's simply a theory, is that the covenants in the 5th century aren't anything like the covenants in the 13th and 14th century. They had very different formats and procedures and things like that. But we have covenants from outside the Bible, quite a few of them, uh, from, uh, from the, the Middle East in the 13th and 14th century, and it's from that period that we see the Bible's covenant matching up. So this tells us that, you know, pretty likely this is how you can date it. And that matches the biblical narrative. The covenant is divided into two parts and then is followed by blessings and warnings. And this, this is true both for the book of the covenant in Exodus and it's true for um, the, in Deuteronomy, and we'll talk about the two parts here in a second, uh, but both are followed by blessings and warnings. In the, in the book of the covenant in Exodus, you find that in chapter 24, and it's a little bit different um, than it is in Deuteronomy, and we'll talk about that as well. So part one, the commandments, uh, this is in the book of the covenant in Exodus, uh, the commandments are found in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. They are then um, repeated and elaborated on in, chap in Deuteronomy chapter 5, 1 through eleven thirty two. And there's some additions that are made to the actual core commandments. These are general commandments that are to be followed no matter the circumstance. So, for example, in Exodus, you're finding, you know, commandments like thou shall not murder right? So there's not a circumstance in which it's okay to murder somebody, right? Or you shouldn't murder in this particular situation. Nope, it's just generally true, you should never murder, right? In Deuteronomy 6, for instance, we see the addition of the great commandment, as Jesus calls it, um, you know, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? That, that great commandment is, is added to the covenant in Deuteronomy in that, that section. And that's, that's a commandment that's not situational. It's just true all of the time. So these, again, are, are general commandments, no matter what the circumstance. Part two is what um, I like to call the rulings. Now, your Bible is probably going to translate it. Um, you're going to see it beginning at the very first of Exodus 21. And you're going to see that where 
the um, it, your Bible may call it ordinances, or it may even use the word commandments, but the underlying word is different. In Exodus 20, it's the word for word, and sometimes it'll be translated commandments. Those 10 commandments are called commandments in other places, uh, but they are um, uh, in at the beginning of this second part in chapter 21, it's actually the word for judgments. And I think rulings is a little bit better for us to understand today because judgments can be in the sense of, you know, like judging someone, judgmentalism and stuff like that. Whereas a ruling, we all understand a ruling is something a judge does, um, interpreting law, creating case law and stuff like that. They're adjudicating. And, um, and so Exodus 21, one, uh, uh, chapter one through uh, the end of chapter 23 is a, this is, this is, these are rulings, not these commandments that we just got. And then in Deuteronomy, we see that um, from starting beginning in chapter 12, verse one through 26, 19, we see the same thing. And what these are, is these are practical applications of the commandments in situational contexts in the society. And, and so it both in the original book of the covenant and then later in Deuteronomy much expanded. What these are is you want to think about, okay, you've got a commandment to, um, you know, honor the Sabbath and that's a general commandment, but there's these rulings that are going to be about some of the things about that. Right. And it's how, how do we, apply the commandment found in the 10 commandments to our various circumstances. And, uh, and then the same thing happens in, in Deuteronomy. So um, we also see in both cases that uh, both Exodus and Deuteronomy, there are blessings for faithfulness and there are penalties for unfaithfulness. In Exodus 24, verses 5 through 8, we see that the blood of the sacrifice indicates death for unfaithfulness in covenant ratification. And, um, and it's what this was, if you think about the Abrahamic covenant, for instance, when you know he splits the animal in half and uh, God passes through uh, the, the midst. And this is a typical way that they would do it. We see the same thing with Laban and, and Jacob. They're, they're, they're cutting an animal. It's where the term cut a covenant uh, came from. And what that um, slaughtered animal represents and what the blood represents is death. And so it it's representing the curse for failure to adhere to the terms of the covenant. So for instance, God is saying, interestingly enough, that if he is not compliant, if he doesn't live up to his side of the covenant, he's saying, I will die. Well, God can't die. So clearly he's going to live up to the, the terms of the covenant, right? Same thing for the people that what they're saying when they agree to the covenant is this, this blood represents their blood. Should they be unfaithful that, that rightfully they can be put to death for unfaithfulness to the covenant. The blood also, however, represents a blessing because they take the single blood of this of bulls. And what, what Moses does is he puts half the blood on the altar and half the blood into bowls that he then sprinkles on the people. And that, that blood between those two um, uh, on God and on the people, the altar represents God, that it comes from the one sacrifice, right? And what it's doing is it's bringing them together in a familial union. So if you think about marriage ceremonies, we do some similar things uh, in marriage ceremonies, uh, lighting a candle, for instance, where both the man and the woman light the, the same candle, right? And usually what happens is they'll, they'll have like three candles and they've got, 
they've lit a candle each and then they take the flame from that and together they light a third candle, something along those lines. And what that's representing is them coming together into union as one. And the blood also represents that this from this single blood, they are, they are now family. And, and then um, we see in Exodus 24, uh, 9 through 11, the leader, Moses and the leaders of Israel have gone up on the mountain and they sit down and they have a meal together. Um, and God doesn't strike them down. They, they believe typically that if they, they saw God, they, they would die. They don't die. Um, they, they're not actually seeing uh, God himself, Yahweh himself. They're seeing an angel. The angel is God's representative. And so they have a meal with God's representative. And the meal is representing family. Like it's a, their family now sitting down together for a meal. In Deuteronomy, it's a little bit more explicit, uh, these blessings. And we see this occurring in chapter 28. The first part of it, verses 1 through 14, is a series of blessings for obedience. So now God, in his modification, he's going to spell it out for him. That these are all the blessings that you're going to get for, for obedience. And, and then in the latter half of the chapter, 15 through 68, uh, is a list of curses for disobedience. Okay, so that's the, that's the format of the Mosaic Covenant. You've got part one is a, a series of fundamentals. These are the commandments, the general commandments, the words of God, literally, that's what it says, the, the 10 words. And, and these are the fundamentals. This is what you really want to understand is the core of what is God's law, right? So for the, um, the people of Israel, the 10 commandments is the law, right? Everything else, these are rulings about the law, right? Now, a lot of times the Bible will refer to the whole thing as the law, but the Bible will refer to the entirety of the Old Testament as the law, including Psalms, which clearly was not considered the law in terms of this, this core. And so when, so it's a little tricky sometimes the, when you're reading along the Bible and you read the word law, well, which, which is it talking about? Is this a general reference to the Old Testament? Is it uh, talking about the books of Moses, which were referred to as the law, or is it referring to the actual law, which was the Ten Commandments? That's part one. Part two is the rulings, and then part three is the blessings and the curses that are upon this covenantal relationship. Okay, the format of the Sermon on the Mount then comes in these same three parts. The first we see, I'm going to call the commandments. This is Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 through 16, where Jesus is sort of laying out for, for the covenant people, kingdom of God people, that this is, this is what your, your core is. This is what you have to be like. This is what you have to adhere to principally um, in all situations. The second part then, I'm going to call the rulings. This is from Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, through Matthew chapter 7, verses 12. This is the practical way in which to, to do those commandments in a variety of circumstances. Now, they're not intended to be comprehensive. They were not intended to be comprehensive in Exodus and Deuteronomy. But they, what they're intended to be is examples that illustrate the how of doing the commandments. And we should read the Sermon on the, Mount, on the Mount this way. We understand this first section, this is telling us the baseline commandments, the words of God, like, like the 10 words in the Old Testament. And then the rest of it is practical examples and teachings of what that looks like. How do you work that out practically? And then there's a final section in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, and then uh, there's some more in 7, 13 through 27 um, that you can read as well, that, um, that are the, uh, the blessings and the warnings. All right, so quick review. Sermon on the Mount, 
is what Jesus taught those who heard the good news and wanted to follow, right? So they heard the good news, kingdom of God is coming, it's here, um, demonstrating it by healing people, uh, calling for repentance, uh, telling them I'm going to free you from oppression and sin and all this kind of good stuff. And, and they like it. They see the healings and they're like, wow, that's great. Um, but there's, there's some people who are real serious. They're like, okay, I want, I want to follow. I want to, I want this. I don't want just that healing. I want, I want this. And I want to hear what you have to say. And those people, they actually got the, the message. The old Mosaic Covenant and the Sermon on the Mount follow the same general pattern. So the Sermon on the Mount is an excellent, excellent place to hear the terms of the New Covenant all in one place. So that's the point of why we're going to take several sessions to, to review the Sermon on the Mount so that we will thoroughly, thoroughly understand what is God requiring of us in terms of commitment to this covenant. And we're, we'll talk a lot more about that.